Thank you for joining me for this uh, video. I am doing an episode of Life Over Coffee. It's episode 401. I'm going to talk about one of the most common themes for why people come to our ministry, and of course that is suffering. If you are watching this video by YouTube, would you please subscribe to our channel, and then also if you're watching on Rumble. This is a podcast episode. It's not an article, so you can see the show notes, the information that I have in it, and in addition to YouTube and Rumble, we always put our videos right inside our episode podcast or inside of our articles, and so you can catch the videos right on our website, plus gain all the other information that are tied to either the article or the episode show notes. Episode 401, thank you so much for joining me. A theology of suffering is a theoretical reality with life-transforming implications if we can live it out robustly and practically with God's fame and the benefit of the community in view. Of course, the saying is true, it's easier said than done. Learning how to live well with suffering should be every Christian's desire because the promise from God in the beginning was that life would be a suffering one, and we all know that, of course. And so in this episode of Life Over Coffee, what I want to do is I want to present four crucial ideas for those who dare to learn these lessons. Hello everyone, this is Rick Thomas and you are listening to the Life Over Coffee podcast. This is episode 401. If you want to look at the show notes for this episode, the title of it is Living Well Requires a Transcendent View of Suffering. When our children were younger, I used to sketch out theological truths for them. I would use initially a piece of paper and then we got the iPad and so I could draw on the pencil with the pencil on the iPad and one of the words that I taught them one of those big 25 cent theological words was transcendent and so we would sketch it out in a caricature type form and I remember that word uh, specifically because what I did to show them what transcendent meant is I drew a rocket like it was going into space and then I drew the clouds and then the rocket was halfway or three-quarter above the clouds and I said that is the word for transcendent that's what transcendent means it rises above and in in context of that definition in order to live out suffering well, we have to have a transcendent view of what suffering is. And so in this podcast, I want to walk through this. And the reason that I want to walk through this is because suffering is foundational to this ministry. God has blessed me. He has been merciful to me in that he has permitted a boatload of suffering in my life. Many of you are familiar with parts or all of my story and and I won't get into the details of that here that information is all over our website but the thumbnail sketch is I was reared with an abusive alcoholic father physically and verbally he was mean as a snake and then later on I, I went to jail uh, for B and E, it's called breaking and entering, and and that was a difficult time in my life as an angry teenager responding wrongly to the suffering that I that came into my life, and that happens so often. We can have suffering that comes in our lives, and then we react adversely to the suffering, which compounds the suffering, and that is exactly what I did. Well, later on, I. I Went, uh, I got married and then I went through a, a horrible divorce uh, after becoming a Christian. So the Christianity did not straighten out my life. Uh, I brought my former manner of life into uh, my Christian experience and my wife and I had no template uh, for how to live well and things combusted and she left and so there I was with that. And then later on, uh, two of my brothers were murdered uh, 10 years apart 
and uh, that in itself brought uh, a, a significant amount of difficulty into my life. And so that's a thumbnail sketch. There's so many details there. And by the way, if you want to talk about any of this, I, I don't have anything to hide from you. I'll be glad to talk about what happened and so forth and so on. But I want you to know that suffering is part of all of our lives, and you have had your share of it as well. And so that is the promise. I mean, you read Genesis 3 after the fall of Adam and Eve. That's our lot in life. That's a part of it. And that is why uh, my personal experience and, of course, living in the reality of a fallen world, suffering is a cornerstone to our ministry. The gospel is foundational to our ministry, but then there are certain things that stand on uh, that foundation. And one of those is most definitely suffering. And that's why I say that living well requires that transcendent view of suffering, not just theoretically, easier said than done, but also practically. Now, for those of you who want to read more about how God helped me to work through my suffering, I do have a book that I wrote 30 years after uh, our divorce. I told the Lord back in the day that I want to take copious mental notes and maybe at some point in the future that as these things crystallize in my mind, I don't want to make all the mistakes that I'm making now. I want to remember those things. And so three decades later, I put those things in a book titled Suffering Well, How to Steward God's Most Feared Blessing, which comes right out of Job's playbook in 325 when he said, the thing that I have feared has come upon me. Job is, the implication goes back to Job chapter 1, where Job was afraid of what God might do. He had a wrong view of who God is, and so he sacrificed and double sacrificed for his children. Well, that thing that he feared had come upon him, and all of us fear suffering. And so it is a promise from God, and we need to know how to suffer well. I would encourage you to get that book. I know we've had some outstanding responses from it. Pat, a dear friend of mine, said it saved her life. Now, I know intertwined in that is a bit of hyperbole, but it was her way to amplify and to appreciate uh, what God was doing through her as she was reading that book. And so we've had a number of good reviews. And uh, if you want to, I would encourage you to read it. What I'm going to do in this podcast, episode 401, Living Well Requires a Transcendent View of Suffering, I'm going to do something very simple, very basic. I'm going to share four scriptures with you. That's it. So if you go to the show notes in episode 401, you will find those four scriptures written out for you. You'll also find the video, you'll find this podcast, and you'll find some other links too. And so if you really want to do a deep dive in suffering, I would encourage you to go to episode 401 and you'll have all of these links. And our content is built for long-term homework assignments. It is not built for the person that just wants to fly by and gain some information and move on to the next thing. You can do that, of course, and many do. But we write our content specifically. We create our content specifically so that people can use them as long-term homework assignments for themselves or for people that they're caring for through discipleship or counseling. Virtually any of our content that we uh, produce could be a six-month assignment for anyone because of all the links that are involved. We do that intentionally. It takes a little uh, extra work to produce this, but we want to help people. And so I would encourage you that if you jump on episode four, 401 and want to do a deeper dive into suffering, then this episode, this template that you have here, the show notes, would be an excellent outline to do that. And so let me give you the outline of this specific uh, podcast, and then I want to get into each one of these four verses sets, okay? I said, number one, removing your ability. I'll explain that. Number two, recalibrating your faith Number three, rethinking your value. And then number four, refining your strength. Let's get into them. Number one, removing your ability. The text that I'm going to share with you is 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. I'll read it and then give a, a little bit of an explanation. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 8 and 9, For we do not want you to be unaware 
brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Second sentence, indeed, or third sentence rather, indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, and then the fourth sentence, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Now, there are several crucial things in these four sentences in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9 that we all need to hear because they're just that valuable, could be just that transformative. The first thing Paul says is, I don't want you to be unaware of what's going on. Now, there is a hybrid, there's a a, a a, a commingling of two ideas that's important for anybody that's going through suffering. One, one idea is suffering, of course, and the other one is leadership. If you're going to suffer well, you have to lead yourself out of that suffering. Anybody who suffers has to have a modicum of a leadership gift or they will not suffer well. And so Paul was, was really... Uh, framing the argument because the thing that could happen and people are susceptible susceptible to this is that when you're going through suffering people will commiserate in an empathetic way in in the wrong way meaning they will jump into your suffering and they will commiserate with you uh, they will pity for you and if you're if you don't lead yourself through suffering you too will be susceptible to pity as well self Pity. And there are a lot of people who are suffering who are self-pitying people because they're not leading themselves through the suffering. The illustration that I like to use is a mom with a, a sick mom, a mom with a cold uh, who has two or three toddlers hanging around her kneecaps. And that mother who is suffering has to lead her family through that day. She has to lead her children through that day or she will be overcome by the suffering. And of course, the children will, uh, they will receive the repercussions of her who is not leading herself through the suffering. And I think virtually every mom has been in that place. And it's a perfect illustration of a, a person who is suffering, but they know they have to lead themselves through it. Well, every other person that suffers has to do that as well. Suffering doesn't require passivity. And so what we see with what Paul is doing here, he is suffering well, and he is taking the initiative. He's being direct. He's on point of his own suffering, and he's going to make sure that nobody misunderstands what's going on here. And so you see a distinct leadership gift that accompanies real painful suffering, he says, we do not want you to be unaware, brothers of the affliction that we experienced in Asia. And then he goes on to say that we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. The big idea in this sentence that I want you to see is that he was burdened beyond his strength. Now, this is the mercy of God, even though it never feels like that in the moment. God has to put us in a place where is we are beyond our ability to fix the situation. And so sometimes God will push us to the point to where we're outside of our competency. We're outside our Adamic tendency to want to be self-reliant and to pull ourselves up by our foot, foot uh, bootstraps or whatever we're wearing and, and, and make this thing right. Because that's our initial temptation is a self-reliant spirit, which is our number one adversary because a synonym for self-reliance is unbelief. I'm going to rely on myself rather than relying on God. The two options are to rely on ourselves, rely on God. One of them is belief in God. The other one is unbelief in God because I'm going to rely on myself. And so, and, and of course, this is exactly what happened in Genesis 3, 6, and 7. Adam and Eve were relying on themselves because the devil questioned God. And so they decided to do it their way rather than God's way. And so self-reliance is our number one an adversary, which is a synonym for unbelief. And so what God has to do in many of our lives, he has to push us outside of our ability uh, to fix the problem or to extricate ourselves from the problem. And this is what Paul is saying, that we were burdened beyond our strength. Now that is a good thing ultimately, but a bad thing when it's happening. In fact, it was so bad for Paul and his team that he ended up saying, indeed, we had received the sentence 
of death. And so they just, they were going to die. They just felt like that that they had the sentence of death on them. And then the last sentence in this verse is the great divine conjunction, but a conjunction grammatically, as you know, joins two thoughts. And so he, he gives us this, here's his leadership. Hey, don't be unaware of what's going on. And then he tells what was going on. And then he brings in this conjunction to explain why. It was to make us. I like that. Make us. And sometimes God just has to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Now, I need to move on to these other scriptures for time's sake, but I just want to make one point here. The title, the sub point here, number one, is removing your ability. God has to remove our ability. But in this last sentence, he says, not to rely on ourselves, but God who raises the dead. He's pointing to the gospel. But what I want you to see here is that he is pointing to an aspect of the gospel. The gospel is like a multifaceted diamond. I mean, the gospel was in eternity past Christ. He's in eternity future. The gospel lived a, a life of humanity. The gospel died on the cross. The God, gospel rose from the dead, ascended into heaven. I mean, the gospel is this multifaceted diamond. And when Paul talks about being beyond your ability, he wants to dial in on one aspect of the gospel. And that is the resurrection. God is teaching us to rely on him who raises the dead. Rather than saying, I want you to rely on him who died on the cross. A lot of people died on the cross. And I'm not minimizing what Jesus did on the cross, but that was a common way of death back then. But relying on him who raises the dead, he really wanted to punctuate the point. That is the aspect of the gospel that we need to focus on, that God can do something that nobody else can do. And so point number one is removing your ability. God pushes, puts us in a place that we can't fix it. Number two is recalibrating your faith. Now this text is Matthew 14, 28 through 33. This is the text of scripture where Peter is walking on the water. And so what's going on in this text? And you can read it here if you want to go to episode 401. You're familiar with the passage. Of course, you can read it uh, in your Bible. But what's happening here is Peter and his uh, friends are on a boat in a dark and stormy night, and they see the Lord coming across the water. And, and Peter asks one of the most important questions that you could ever ask God when you're heading into suffering. And, and Peter says this, Lord, is it you? And, and again, the subtitle here is uh, recalibrating your faith. And so Peter wanted to know, is this the Lord? And that's the most essential thing that you could ever ask the Lord when you're going through suffering. God, is this you? The idea is about faith here. Because Peter was going to step out on the water and he was going to walk on the water. He's going to have a supernatural experience. And so if you're going to have a supernatural experience with the Lord, you need to know that that is the Lord that you are walking to. You see, faith is like a telescope. And what I mean by that is, is you know, some people say, you know, I have to drum up faith. I have to have more faith. And that's kind of quirky and theoretically hard to get your mind around. But if you think about faith as the object that you're looking at, and so our faith is in my ability to work through a problem. That's self-reliance. That's where my faith is. So that's the object of my faith. I have an outcome out here, and I'm going to work toward that outcome through self-reliant efforts. Well, that's not going to work because that's the wrong kind of faith. That's faith in yourself. And so Peter is asking, Lord, is this you? Because he wanted the faith. The object of your faith is really what determines how your life is going to go. And so when you're going through a difficult time, you're about to step into a difficult time, Lord, is that you? And you want to keep your eye on the Lord. The object of your faith is the big idea. Well, Jesus said, yeah, that's me. And then he says this, come. I want you to come to me. He said, I want you to get out of that boat and I want you to walk to me. I want you to have a supernatural experience. But he, he distilled that down to one monosyllabic grunt, kind of like a teenager when they come home. How was your day? Good. How are you doing? Fine. Do you want some ice cream? Yeah. I mean, Jesus distilled it down to one word, come. And I think there's some insight here because Jesus just said, hey, come. I mean, if the object of your faith is me, come. I mean, just come. He, Jesus would not explain to him all that was going to happen. 
Jesus was not going to explain the dynamics of walking on the water and the impossibility of it and what he could do by having this supernatural experience with God. Because if Jesus had given him all the answers to what was about to happen, then Peter's pay, pays Peter's faith could have easily shifted from the object of what his faith should be, Christ, to another object, which is the known outcome. Jesus, if you tell me what the known outcome is, I will do what you ask me to do. But where is your faith? Your faith is in the known outcome, not in Christ. And so Peter got out of the boat and he walked on the water and he came to Jesus. Now, just a little side point here. Peter, people knock Peter for what he did. I don't. They knock him for what he did. I don't because the other folks in the boat didn't do that. And though he was trembling and though he started sinking, and I, I get all that, but he got out of the boat. And so I commend him for that. And it says when he saw the wind and he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out. Again, because his object of his faith was Christ, when he cried out, he said these words, Lord, save me. He was crying to the very one that he had faith in. And then the next two words, I think, are the most important words in the entire text in verses 28 through 33. It says, Jesus immediately. He immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him saying, Oh, you of little faith. See, that's what it's talking about. You had me as the object of your faith. I told you to come. I didn't give you any more data, but I told you to come. And you did, and you kept me in view as the object of your faith. And then when things started happening because it was falling apart, well, at least you cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately rescued him because Peter's faith was really a line. He just got discombobulated there for, uh, discombobulated there for a, a little bit. But Jesus immediately, and that's something that we need to know. When our faith is on Christ and, this, and, the, and the winds come and we start sinking, it's important to know God is with us. As, Je as Genesis 39.2 says, God was with Joseph. Those, that's one of those profound, short little sayings in the Bible. And God was with G uh, Peter. Uh, because Peter's faith was a line. He just got shook up in the moment, as we all do. Of course, the wind ceased. They got back in the boat, and they worshiped, and they said, truly, you are the Son of God, and that's how it should go. And so point number one is removing your ability. Point number two is recalibrating your faith. I realize I'm moving through these things rapidly, and there's so much more to say, but you're getting the big ideas and then point number three is rethinking your value. And this is 2 Corinthians 4, 7, and, uh, 7 through 12. This is the passage where Paul talks about having jars of clay uh, in a treasure. We have this treasure, rather. We have this treasure in jars of clay. And so we are the recyclable clay pots. Dime a dozen don't mean a lot. It's just a clay pot. They're cracked. They're abused. They're dinged and dented. And that is who we are. By the way, there is an echo here of what the word Adam means in Genesis 2-7, where it says that Adam was uh, brought, created from the dust of the earth. The word Adam means, uh, part of the word Adam means red man. And so he's a dirt clod. Uh, he's a dust man. He's a dirt man. We're all dirt clods and we're jars of clay. And this is what Paul is saying in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 4 and 7, uh, chapter 4, verse 7. And so the thing that Paul is saying here that I really want you to see is that we have this treasure in jars of clay. And then Paul explains why we have this treasure in jars of clay. He says, comma, to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. And that's an incredible statement. You see, God will not compete with us. It'll be us being self-reliant or we'll be relying on God, but there will be no competition if we choose to be self-reliant that I don't want to be a jar of clay. I don't want to be weakened. I don't want to be vulnerable. I don't want to be this person that can be easily broken. I don't want to be that person. So I am going to be a gold stud gold plated diamond studded box i'm going to be that i'm going to be the treasure i need my self esteem i'm going to build myself and i'm going to shine my light 
I'm not going to be weak, vulnerable. I'm not going to boast in my weakness. That's too difficult. And so put the treasure in that. God won't. He resists the proud. He's a warring army against the proud, as he said in James 4, 7. And so he's not going to do that. God wants us in a position of weakness. Why? He said, so that he can show the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. If you put the treasure in a gold-plated, diamond-studded box, you could look at the treasure, you look at the box, you can't see the difference. And it, it could very easily be all about you. Well, you're the gold-plated box with the diamond studs on the outside of it. There's a treasure inside of you. You are a magnificent person. And that's the problem. And so if you want to go down that road, you can. But what God does, and this is what Paul was saying in St. Corinthians 1, 8, I don't want you to be unaware of what is happening to us. God is pushing us beyond our ability. He is making us weak. We despaired of life. We even thought that we had a death sentence upon us. That is a jar of clay. That is a broken clay pot. God wants to do that. He is removing our ability. He's recalibrating our faith so that we're focused on Him. And He's rethinking our value. And this is hard for the self-esteemer. This is hard for the first world country mindset to be able to embrace this. And then finally, point number four, he's refining our strength. And this is 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. You know this passage also. This is the thorn in the flesh. Similar to Job where God had this conversation with Satan and, and saying, hey, have you considered my servant Job? And then boom, 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 these things happened to Job. Well, Paul, uh, God, uh, had Satan to administer a thorn in the flesh. And he said that he gave this thorn in the flesh to harass him. Paul, as he reflected back on this moment, said because of the surpassing greatness, the revelations and uh, all the wonderful things that God was doing to me, I had a propensity to be proud. And so God in his mercy put a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me. Of course, Paul prayed three times and, and asked God to remove it, which is a impulse, normal instinct. And we should all do that, by the way, when suffering comes. I mean, the first call to action, I think, to pray for it to go away. I would. I have many times, and I'm sure you have too. But if it does not go away, then we have to do, uh, we have to recalibrate things. We have to refine our strength, which is this subheading here. And so God said, no, I'm not going to ever take it away as long as you live. But my grace is sufficient for you, for my power. And this is what he was saying in 4-7 of 2 Corinthians about the, the jar of clay, so that the surpassing power of God will be on display. My power is made perfect in weakness. There's the juxtaposition of the clay pot and the treasure again. That's how God works. He works in weakness. And so the power, the treasure goes in the clay pot. The power goes into weakness. Now Paul embraced this message. And so he said, therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses. Why? He explains so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And then he finishes this section in 2 Corinthians 12, 7, uh, 7 through 10. He says, For the sake of Christ, then I am content with weaknesses, with insults, with calamities, with hardships, with persecutions. And then I think in this last short sentence in this section, he gives us what I believe is probably for us, humans, the, this should probably be our bumper sticker. For when I'm weak, then I am strong. And that's what he was saying right from the first of this book. I don't want you to be unaware of the affliction that we have gone through. Here's the affliction. We were weak. We had a sentence of death. We were burdened beyond our strength. We were jars of clay. We have a thorn of flesh. Weak, 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 and weak. But he had a transcendent view of weakness. And so he said, for when I'm weak, then I am strong. And this is a, a beautiful overview of Paul's theology of suffering mixed in with what Peter learned in, in, in uh, Matthew 14 when he was walking on the water. This is episode 401. I titled it, Living Well Requires a Transcendent View of Suffering. I have just laid out a transcendent view of suffering. Now, you have the ideas, but working through these things are 
extremely difficult. There is no lying. I mean, it is absolutely difficult to work through these things. As I've said in other podcasts, you can do many things alone, but you cannot. You cannot do your sanctification alone. And when it comes to suffering, one of the worst things that we can do is isolate. Because applying these truths practically is difficult. But I will tell you that they are life changing. They will totally alter your life and just put you on a whole nother plane, like that rocket ship transcending above the clouds. As we get a theology of suffering, it will lift us up above the suffering. We'll have the right view. We'll also have the right practice, and then we will be able to help others in those time, in their time of need. As Paul says, we will comfort others in the way that we have been comforted. Thank you so much for listening. Music